welcome. Uh, thank you for your patience. I know it's been a been a long day. Uh, it is the custom of this committee that all witnesses to testify uh, are to be sworn. Could I ask you to please rise and raise your right hand? Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record indicate that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. I'm going to offer a brief uh, introductions of, of each of the witnesses, and then you'll be allowed five minutes for an opening statement. Dr. Jack Needleman is currently an associate professor in the Department of Health Services at the UCLA School of Public Health. In 2007, he was inducted as an honorary fellow of the American Nursing Academy. Before beginning his tenure at UCLA, Dr. Needleman was a member of the faculty of the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Ralph Dilatori is a nationally resound cardiac surgeon and innovative healthcare businessman. Dr. Ralph Dilatori became the president and CEO of Caritas Christi Healthcare, uh, three facilities in my district, a matter of uh, disclosure. In April of 2008, with 12,000 employees, Caritas Christi is the 11th largest employer in Massachusetts. As CEO, Dr. Delatore's mission is to revolutionize the delivery of health care in the region by moving integrated clinical services out into the communities where patients live. In addition to his clinical endeavors, Dr. Delatore has served as a health care consultant. Mr. Mark Merritt is the president and CEO of the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, the national associate rep association representing America's pharmacy benefit managers, lower prescription drug costs for more than 200 million Americans, and manage about 70 percent of the more than 3 billion prescriptions dispensed in the United States each year. Mr. Merritt has served as a senior strategist with America's Health Insurance Plans and the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Needleman, Dr. Needleman, excuse me, you now have five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Lynch, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify. Let me add just one item to the uh, biography that you provided, which is prior to going to Harvard, I was uh, vice president and co-director of the public policy practice at Lewin ICF, now the Lewin Group, a uh, thing that has some meaning in these halls. Uh, you have my written testimony, so I simply want to highlight uh, a few key points from it, some of which have been made today but perhaps deserve one more hammer hitting the nail. Uh, the first point is simply that the, the federal uh, employee health benefit plans, by and large, are using the current standard practice of contracting with PBMs for their, for their drug benefits. And measured against a standard of what you would pay if you were strictly retail, there are substantial savings. The industry sponsored uh, a study in, published in 2008 or put out in 2008 that estimated about a 28 percent discount from retail, which I would say, given its industry sponsored, should be treated as an upper bound. You know, that's a considerable savings, uh, but it is not appropriate to be measuring the benefits of the PDM structure in FEHBP against uh, retail. That is the wrong standard. Uh, we've seen some discussion today about other more appropriate standards, and I think it is very clear that compared to other large federal purchasers, uh, there is considerable evidence to date that the uh, FEHBP plans are getting smaller discounts than other federal purchasers. We can't tell how substantial those discounts are or what PBMs are being paid for their services because of a lack of transparency in PBM billing of plans. To put it very simply, the PBMs buy on one schedule, they bill to the federal government and other health plans on a different schedule. Uh, as has been discussed by prior participants, prior panel members, for generic drugs, the purchasing is built on a, uh, an MAC, a, a maximum allowable cost drug schedule, which will vary from PBM to BPM and may vary from where they're getting the drugs uh, across the plans, plus administrative fees. Uh, for for generic, for on patent, branded, sole source drugs, they are being, they are paying a negotiated price, and that negotiated price has a whole variety of discounts that potential and rebates that are potentially associated with them. Uh, the size of those uh, 
discounts are a function of the bargaining power of the, the PBM. And in part, that includes the threat of whether or not to include the drug in the formulary or how, uh, how much, uh, how, gen- how, ben- how well tiered it will be within the formulary of a plan. That's where the bargaining power to negotiate the discount comes from. The historic practice of the PBMs for actually billing the folks who have contracted with them to conduct these services is either an aggregate amount or a percentage of wholesale or some other measure which may or may not make clear what was pa- – typically doesn't make clear what was paid as costs for the drugs themselves and what is being charged for administrative services. That lack of transparency has been heavily criticized by purchasers and consumer groups, and there have been some efforts to address it. Uh, the Human Resources Policy Association, the group of human resource uh, uh, managers for, the lo- for large businesses, have developed standards for transparency in pharmaceutical purchasing, which include uh, charging the ac- acquisition costs, both at retail and mail order for drugs, passing through all rebates from manufacturers and other firms should demand and enforce contract billing provisions for costs separated from the administrative charges and profits that are being made. Uh, So separate billing that provides for a clear accounting of the costs of the drugs, the administrative costs and fees being paid to pharmacies and other third parties, and the administrative profits and fees associated with the PBM services. The FEHBP plans, either collectively or individually, need to negotiate hard for appropriate administrative fees and consider either make versus buy decisions or going to a single vendor as TRICARE has in order to get a good deal for the federal government. Uh, They should also consider whether to use scheduled federal prices or negotiated prices for FEHBP in lieu of going with the PBM negotiated prices. It's clear that PBMs provide a variety of services beyond negotiated prices, enrollment and eligibility determination, claims paying, checks for drug-drug interactions, patient education, facilitating therapeutic interchange and use of appropriate use of generics. With more transparent pricing, it would be, be, we would be in a far better position to assess the cost and value of these services rather than simply including them as the full package at a price that is not clear. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Delatore, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Is the microphone working now? It says a no. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this hearing. The rising cost of health care, as we all know, is dealing a crippling blow to employers across the United States. Escalating premiums suffocate not only the employees, but employers who struggle to provide a benefit to their employees. At At the forefront of this escalation is the cost of prescription drugs. Controlling prescription drug costs is essential to containing health care costs. Unlike many other contributors to the, to the cost of health care, prescription drugs serve not only in the treatment of illness, but as a preventative measure. This is especially true in the treatment of chronic illness. Many recent reports document how escalating co-pays on the pharmaceuticals lead to noncompliance on behalf of patients. This non-utilization can lead to the escalation of chronic illness and the subsequent grave implications to patient and employer. As a specific example, patients who fail to comply with medications that control blood sugar or hypertension are more likely to develop atherosclerosis, which can lead to heart attack and stroke. For all these reasons, to describe but a few, it is imperative that an employer, through the benefits offered at employees, control prescription drug costs. Within the context of my comments, the federal government is the largest employer in the United States of America. Like all large employers, the federal government should capitalize on its purchasing power to lower its cost of goods and services. In fact, this concept is at the very essence of our capitalist economy. Healthcare should be no different. When the largest employer in the United States addresses the cost of providing prescription drugs to its employees, the first step seems obvious. Federal government should use its purchasing power to secure preferential pricing for its insurance plans and for its employees. The next question is how? What method? What means does the federal government have to secure such pricing without a time consuming overhaul in healthcare delivery? In review of our current practice, I will propose one, 
but, not, but obviously not the only solution to stimulate some discussion. In 1992, Section 340B of the Public Health Service Act was enacted. This act requires drug manufacturers to provide outpatient drugs to certain covered entities at a reduced price. This process was, set, was further simplified through the creation of a prime vendor. This process routinely yields pharmacy savings of 25 to 50 percent for the covered entities beyond that of BP, PPMs or GPOs. Rather than create a second parallel process for group purchasing, we should look to expand participation in this program to benefit some or all federal employees and the United States government. One relatively simple solution would be to modify Section 340B of the Public Health Service Act and the subsequent Pharmacy Affairs Branch definition of what constitutes a patient at a disproportionate share hospital to simply include federal employees within a geographic region. A qualifying entity could then establish an outpatient pharmacy complete with mail order and internet capabilities to provide prescription drugs at markedly discounted prices. In fact, many 340B hospitals already do this, this same thing. Since these entities are not allowed to resell or mark up 340B prices, a minimal processing and handling fee would be the only incremental cost added to the below wholesale prices. This would not only provide markedly reduced prices, but a highly transparent pricing mechanism. This decreased pharmaceutical cost would be incorporated into the various health plans available to federal employees without limiting their choice of insurance product. These savings could then pass through the employer in the, to the employer in the form of decreased premiums and to the patient employee in the form of decreased premiums and decreased co-pays. Mr. Chairman, I want to reiterate my thanks for inviting me to this hearing. I also pledge my assistance and the assistance of my, of my organization, Caritas Christi Healthcare, in combing through this difficult struggle of ensuring access, maximizing quality, and minimizing costs in healthcare. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Merritt, you're now recognized for, for five minutes. Good afternoon. Uh, it is still the afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Lynch, and thank you for your time. My name is Mark Merritt. I'm president of the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. Mr. Merritt, Associ could you please pull that? Sure. You know, I think there's something wrong with that cord. It's actually tied up so that they can't pull it any closer. Uh, Let's see if I can get a little closer. All right. Is that all right? I'll just kind of lean in a little bit. There you go. See if I can read and lean at the same time. I'm not sure. Um, I'm president of the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, uh, the PBM Association. It sounds like I have my work cut out for me, uh, but that's what we do. Uh, we're proud of what we do. We work for the large employers, unions, government agencies, Medicare Part D, FEHPP, of course, and so forth. And our clients aren't small players. They're big, sophisticated, savvy people we negotiate very hard against, folks like the drug manufacturers. So it's kind of odd for uh, everybody else to seem like the victim. We often feel that way ourselves as we're negotiating for lower prices, pushing for more generics, pushing for biogenerics, and so forth. Um, but we use a number of tools and strategies, which I don't need to get into, to increase generic utilization. It's a lot more than just the unit cost of the drug that we're involved in. It's all of pharmacy costs. And we would view ourselves not as the cause of the complexity of the system, but a result of it, an attempt to help payers sort through it, sort through everything from manufacturers, retailers, wholesalers, everything that's involved to using technology, e-prescribing, uh, different forms of delivery like mail service delivery and so forth, all of which in different forms FEHPP uses. But we were hired to create these uh, benefit packages for different reasons, I'd say, for instance, than VA uh, or Medicaid, because we're hired by clients who want us to create good benefit packages that will retain and attract employees, particularly FEHPP, which competes against the private sector all the time. So to use, and I know this is kind of a maybe an, uh, a marginal example, but to use a tool like uh, like uh, VA uses of limited formularies of pharmacies, which there can be dozens of miles away, is not the kind of thing that FEHBP would want to use, even though it may well save them money. Again, it's the client's choice, and clients choose all kinds of different ways to save money. Uh, but for the record, the GAO and others have looked at what we do. The GAO has looked at what we've done at FEHBP. As we've heard earlier, we do save money to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Um, the OPM has noted how much we save uh, for them and that we do it in a consumer-friendly way. These aren't the old HMOs of 10 or 15 years ago that saved money by keeping you from doing things and getting what you need. We provide broad formularies, broad access, generous packages, um, lots of retail pharmacies, 60,000 retail pharmacies, and so forth. I should note that PBMs are accustomed to uh, a great degree of accountability. We expect it. We get it on the front end and the back end and during the process. 
these sophisticated purchasers who work with us not only are working through their HR departments, they hire very expensive lawyers and very savvy consultants to look over all these contracts before they sign anything with us. And the Federal Trade Commission has noted it's a very competitive process. There are lots of different PBMs. I know all these guys are not very fond of each other. They will steal business in a moment from each other for any, if any little extra bit of fat is left on there. So the competition drives prices down more than you might think. Um, it's important to note on the transparency issue uh, that it's something to be careful with. Intuitively, it seems like the more you see, the better off you'd be. Um, but we went through this during Medicare Part D, where there is a provision uh, to make everything transparent in Medicare drug pricing. And the reason it was considered, I think it was by Senator Grassley and others, is because we need to save money and pay for the drug benefit, much like the discussions we're having now. They were surprised when it went to the Congressional Budget Office, and they found not only didn't, didn't it save money, but it actually increased costs by 10 percent, I think about $40 billion. And people wondered why. And it was because, ironically, with transparency, especially when it's public, when any information can be made public through any means, the beneficiaries aren't the consumers, but it's all the people we negotiate against, all the people we play off against each other, the drug makers, drug stores, and so forth. They're all competing with each other. And if they know what their, uh, what their competitor's pricing is, basic economics, it's not really basic, it's a little more complex than that, but the basic practices that economists agree happen, is it, it reduces any interest to underbid their opponents because they know exactly how low they can go. And if they knew how low we got some of their opponents or some of their competitors, they'd be surprised and they'd price accordingly. So transparency, we're for it. There is no uniform definition of it. Different clients want it to different degrees. Some clients don't care at all as long as you hit your numbers, quote, unquote. Others really want to pour through the books and see all kinds of different information. That's the client's decision. They can decide on the front end. Um, but in conclusion, I'd say that not only do we look forward to working with you and being helpful, we know this is complicated. Uh, we know it's not easy. That's why we're in existence. But we'd hope that any future discussions of transparency in FEHBP or elsewhere focus not just on PBMs but all the providers in FEHBP, hospitals, physicians, nursing homes, independent drug stores, drug manufacturers, wholesalers, and so forth, because we're about 10 percent of the spend and we're happy to be looked at. But if you're looking at a holistic view of this, everybody should be looked at. Uh, and I'd also hope that any related legislative proposals that you do consider, that you consider maybe getting them scored from CBO on the front end uh, to see maybe how they can be, be made better and also to make sure that the costs are fully understood if there are costs. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Merritt. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Needleman. In your, in your testimony, which was very helpful, and we thank you for it, uh, in your written testimony, you, you cited uh, there were two different reports there, I believe, in trying to do an assessment on, on, the, on the federal employee health benefit uh, savings from contracting with PBMs. The 2003 GAO report, I think, estimated 18 percent. And then there was another report called the PCMA report that had uh, estimated savings at 28 percent. Right. Uh, that's like a 33 percent uh, difference. Uh, what do you think uh, might attribute to that different assessment? It, it, it all goes back to the cost base. Uh, the Price Waterhouse, Price Cooper's Waterhouse uh, report, the 2008 report, uh, was working off of retail prices. Uh, GAO was just looking at drug pricing, not taking into account the other services, but was looking at wholesale prices as their benchmark. I see. Now, the suggestion that you made that, that uh, folks break out the, the cost and the profit administratively, and, and, um, have you seen other plans that, that break it out that way, and has it been uh, helpful in those instances? Well, one of the questions I would have asked uh, the Rear Admiral if I had had a chance to ask him was exactly what the pricing looks like under the TRICARE contract. And I would hope you do that, since they, in fact, have straight FSS or other negotiated prices for the drug components. There must be explicit pricing for the other components of the contract as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. De La Torre, thank you as well for coming down at, at my request, uh, basically. Um, I was – I have to – 
ask you, I was reading the Boston Globe uh, this morning, and I saw that the unfortunate story on the severe budget cuts for Commonwealth care, and this is something that we're all dealing with, and it really has – it's that situation that puts pressure on us here to try to find savings in, in these different programs. But uh, this action at – you know, by, in Massachusetts will no doubt have implications on the national health care debate. I think we're looking at different uh, – different examples, uh, uh, different models. And as a participant of that program, participant of that program, um, do you have certain observations that might be instructive to us uh, during our debate here, what went wrong and, and what uh, perils we might avoid? Sure. No, thank you. Uh, I, I think that the fundamental problem is that there's really three – components to health care reform or health care delivery, which is really access, cost, and quality. And you can't deal with one, i.e. access, without really intertwining the other two, cost and quality. You can't, without addressing the structure of health care delivery, say, okay, we're going to open the doors to everybody and not expect the cost to choke everybody or the quality to become abysmal. So I think the very discussion that is happening in this room looking at other methods, other structures of providing health care is the structure that is the discussion that needs to be had across all the components of health care. So I applaud you and the committee for looking at this this very thing, but I think that's what needs to happen is we have to look at health care's entire structure, not just demand increased access and expect it to not choke ours. Unfortunately, we usually we, we have a tendency to look at the, the fastest mover and and what we're seeing is uh you know, the, the price of uh, pharmaceuticals uh, rising at a much faster rate than, say, uh, you know, hospital-based care. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know, I know some of that, at least some of that, is due to higher utilization rates. These mm -hmm. new products, new pharmaceuticals, actually substituting for what was previously, you know, in-house in care. Um, let me ask you that. You, you were on uh, one of those financial shows the other day, CNBC or something like that. And, uh, you know, they, they ask you what are the drivers of cost, and you mentioned, uh, you know, utilization. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for, for your facility, your facilities, your system, uh, I'm very familiar with that. How, how is that a driver? Uh, you know, we, we were looking at these unit costs and product costs, as Mr. Merritt mentioned. Uh, how is that utilization rate, uh, you know, a driver of, of uh, costs? Well, if, if you look at the actual per-episode health care delivery, there's not a lot of profit in it. Most nonprofit hospitals have margins of 1%, 2%. Last year, I think in Massachusetts, the average community hospital net margin was less than 1%. So, I mean, those are not margins that drive the exons of the world, obviously. So what is driving this? What is, what's going on? It's, I, you know, a lot of us think it's utilization. Um, it's we're using too much health care. It's not – that um, the price of every unit, let's put prescription drugs aside, is too high. And what drives that? Well, you know, there's three basic components that drive utilization. One is, which we've heard a lot about, is preventative, is it's defensive medicine. It's physicians who over-order studies, who do too many tests, too many exams to kind of prevent themselves from getting sued. Um, another component is what I call medicine as a vocation versus a business. And, and Dr. Atul Gawande had a great article in New Yorker not long ago, The Cost Conundrum, which you know, I encourage all to read, which addresses this, which is in somehow and in some locations, a group of healthcare providers, physicians, or hospital, medicine stopped being a vocation and became a business. And if it's a business, then obviously increased utilization makes the business more profitable. And that becomes a driver in and of itself. It becomes the culture of the location. And then the third component is, is society-driven utilization. We as a society, and this is where, where drugs really come into play, we as a society are convinced that if it's newer and more expensive, it's got to be better. We as a society spend 25, I've heard estimates, up to 30% of all healthcare costs in the last six months of life because as a society, we want to live forever. You know, we as a society uh, uh, are very proactive. High-end surgery, high-end medicines are got to be better than just basic care and preventative care. So I think those three components really drive utilization and are really driving the cost of health care 
across the United States, including pharmaceutical benefits, through the roof. Let me ask you then, as an employer, I mean, you're, I think that in your introduction they said uh, that uh, Caritas was seventh or eighth size employer. How do, how do you how do you you mentioned this before in our our meeting uh, a few weeks ago? Uh, how do you address the needs as an employer yeah. for for your your folks? Well, the things that we're doing is is we're going heavily into primary care, trying to really emphasize the preventative medicine, try to emphasize the contact with the primary care physician rather than being tertiary driven. Um, we have our own insurance plan, um, and interestingly enough, we run we run 340B pharmacies through it, which is a market reduction in cost. Uh, explain to explain how that works, because I think you know just for someone who's listening and not not terribly sure. familiar with the process. So um, the 340B program, uh, as I was saying, entails us to buy drugs in disproportionate share hospitals, um, certain high-end disproportionate share hospitals, at a markedly reduced price, statutorily. Some would say an unfairly reduced price. That's a separate discussion. Um, and it's what we do is since we, our employees become our patients in a limited network product, then they become patients of the hospital. They buy pharmaceuticals, and we give them pharmaceuticals through our hospital pharmacies, um, which get the 340B pricing. And that's a market reduction uh, well below anything that we can get through PBMs and, uh, and GPOs for our whole hospital. And we have a fair amount of purchasing cloud, as you know. You know, we, we do between 250 and 300,000 emergency room visits in our system. We do about a million outpatient visits. We do 80 to 100,000 um, discharges, ballpark figures. So we have a fair size, uh, fair amount of market clout. But uh, the 340B pricing really allows us to take it to the next level down. Now, do you have a, a gatekeeper type uh, uh, feature on, on your own uh, uh, health benefit plan or, or even pharmaceutical? We, we don't really establish a gatekeeper philosophy. I mean, we, we, we're trying to, and we're in the process of, of really incorporating IT. We're spending, as you probably know, $70 million over three years in IT to go completely paperless, not only the hospitals, but all 1,200 of our of Caritas Christi Network physicians are going to be on electronic health record within the next uh, within the next year, 18 months. And um, all that is going to be tied to our pharmacies also. Um, we're also bringing in, we've just signed a partnership deal with Microsoft that's going to uh, provide health vault benefits to all of our patients so they can manage and be part of their own health care. I think a lot of this is, is in health care overall, is pushing it out to the home, pushing it out to the patients, out to the communities where care is a, it can be centered, be more preventative, and also be more cost effective. You know how much it costs to provide health care in Boston, not because anybody's ripping anybody off, but because, you know, hey, a parking space recently sold in Boston for $300,000. So cost has got to be put somewhere. All right. Uh, Mr. Merritt, the, I, I understand the model, uh, the competitive model that, that is, is uh, referred to uh, with uh, – you know, pharmacy benefit managers. However, in, in practice, or at least from, from where I sit, uh, there's so much complexity there that it's difficult to see how, how folks could compete on price when you can't even figure out what the price is. And it's especially difficult for some of these plans that might not have the degree of sophistication that's necessary. I mean, when my auditors can't figure out what the price is, and they're, they're professionals in that, that specific area, I mean, how, do, how does, you know, a, and, I, and I'm not saying we're relying on lay people when we do this assessment. Sure. But uh, how, how, does the, how does that competitive model actually work if you've got such complexity there and lack of transparency? Uh, well, first of all, not many people do what you're doing right now, and I applaud you for really taking the time to try to learn it. It is very complex. It's just complexity that we're dealing with, not creating. Um, but the savings are real because it's not just about the drug unit costs. It's about relationships with drug stores and wholesalers and manufacturers. It's about using technology, like we championed a bill last year on electronic prescribing and Medicare, which the President added more funding to in the stimulus package, which we really appreciate. Uh, it's a people don't know what they're 
uh, drugs are. They don't know what drugs often they're taking. They don't know the cost share, and they don't know the alternatives. The doctors don't know. So there's a big lack of knowledge there I'm in the physician community. Um, in terms of how drugs are negotiated, you're right. Going up against the pharmaceutical industry isn't easy. Um, but it is a competitive system. And I always say this. People don't have to use a PBM, and I don't say that in a kind of a snide way. It's just that we add real value, and people pay us to do things, and they wouldn't do that unless the savings were really big. And, again, these are unions and automakers. These are not pushovers. And the Medicare Part D program, which has rigorous transparency, rigorous accountability, lots and lots of regulations. So we can deal with that because we do add value. Um, but the only thing I can say in a specific answer to your question is our job is always to remain on the cutting edge and finding out where any fat is. We're kind of like the shark in the ecosphere. Nobody really wants us there, but we play a vital role uh, of keeping things going, keeping folks honest, uh, and it's very hard. Uh, but it is very effective. The savings are real. And we do – most of the things that are said about PBMs are said by folks – from either the drug store community or pharma or others, and then honest people who just sincerely are trying to figure it out. But when folks like GAO or the Federal Trade Commission or others look into us and really do a thorough, exhaustive study, the results are usually pretty good and usually validate uh, what we do and that it adds real value. Yeah, that, that has never been in question. I, I believe you were here for the testimony of the Inspector General for the Office of Personnel Management. and. Uh, despite his description of the difficulties that he was having in, in ascertaining value and, and wading through the complexity of it, he said that, you know, the, the pharmacy benefit managers were a good deal, uh, you know, a, a good, good model to use and were, uh, were of high value. So, but he did say, you know, we, we, we got a lot of work to do in order to, you know, make it more transparent so that we can be assured of that. So... Can I, can I give you one more example? I don't mean to belabor this, but um, there are a lot of tools that don't get used because of special interests. For instance, home delivery. Seniors love it in Medicare. 90-day supply saves a ton of money, increases inheritance. People love it. Medicare could save probably $30 billion over 10 years if they use that more aggressively. I'm sure FEHPP and other programs could, too. But because of pressure from various special interest groups who don't want that to happen, like the independent drugstore lobby or others, it's always held back. And so our challenge to – I'm sorry, Mr. Merritt. What, what are they not taking advantage of? Well, uh, home, home delivery, mail service oh, delivery. Yeah. Uh, some re retailers use it. Um, <clears throat> PBMs use it. Saves a fortune. Very, very popular with consumers. And we're always encouraging clients to use it. More clients are using it now in these economic times because it saves money and they realize their people like it. Uh, but sometimes policymakers have a tough time addressing that because of other concerns. Um, and so we would say that on issues like that, on issues like biogenerics, which we strongly, strongly support, there are policies that can help move this along. And we, we want to do our part as PBMs, but we also want to offer any counsel we can of ways that we think – uh, can help finance health reform or other things that you're looking to finance. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Needleman, uh, earlier in your testimony, your written testimony anyway, you uh, mentioned that uh, the HR Policy Association uh, certifies uh, uh, PBMs that comply with the, uh, certain standards. Uh, do, do you know if the larger uh, uh, pharmacy uh, benefit managers like Medco and Caremark uh, Express scripts that were mentioned earlier. Uh, did these folks have that same certification? Uh, the short answer is yes, a large number of them do. There's actually on their website, which is cited in my testimony, there's a list of which PBMs have been certified by the program and includes a number of the large ones uh, that are currently operating within uh, FEHBP. And if they if they agree to, to meet those standards, are they required to to do so across business lines, uh, you know, can they do it in one area and, and, and be in noncompliance in another? Based upon the, the conversation I had with, uh, uh, blank on the name, Miss um, Smith? Smith uh, prior to, yes, on the first panel. Oh, uh, Sue Hayes. Ms., yes. Prior to the first panel, she, she, what she indicated is uh, the PBMs are offering transparent pricing and they're offer, also offering uh, traditional pricing. And uh, the 
net prices that are coming out for some reason that I cannot explain by any economics I've been trained in, uh, the transparent pricing is coming out higher. <laughs> yeah. I can explain that if you're interested, <laughs> but that's another issue. Mr. Merritt, you want to take a crack at that? I, I will. I will. I'm sorry. If I don't do it, nobody else will. So <laughs> I might as well That's die. why you're here. That's why I'm here. I'll, I'll play my role here. Um, the reality is the market dictates what we do. Our PBM, the, the com these companies are not fans of one another, these PBMs. They are looking to steal business all the time. If clients want a transparent part product that's cheaper and it can be priced for that, they're going to get it. All of this implies that there's some sort of conspiracy to avoid transparency, which well, is you, you got to admit it doesn't look good when you got to pay extra for transparency. You... I, I know, I know, but the reality is all of our companies would say they have transparent products that are better than their others, better than their uh, uh, competing uh, companies. They're transparent in different ways, but we do know this. The marketplace is very agnostic on transparency. Mostly they just want to hit their numbers. I mean, in other words, they see transparency as a subset of the cost issue. When costs go up, they want to say, hey, why are the costs going up? Where's the fat in the system? I want to know what's going on. If there's transparency and it doesn't reduce costs, and this gets back to what CBO and others have said, that's a problem. If there were more transparent products that save money, our companies would be all over it. They know what folks like you are looking at and regulators and policymakers. They, they want to be as transparent as possible. They want to position themselves as the transparent, cheaper company. So to the degree they're able to do that, they will. Where they're, where they're not willing to go is a situation that will open up all of the pricing strategies with the drug companies and the drug stores to the drug companies and the drug stores, either through consultants or others, which completely they put us in a position when we're negotiating of playing poker against these guys with all of our cards facing up and we can't negotiate any savings. So just from pure market, pure selfishness, pure market forces, any of our companies would love to offer a transparent product that was much cheaper if one existed, and to the degree there, there are those, they're going to offer them. Mm. Okay. You know, uh, earlier today we were talking about the possibility of uh, classifying the, the – uh, PBM as a subcontractor, requiring them to, you know, and I'm actually going to introduce legislation to do just this, get them into that federal acquisition uh, regulation because I can't understand the system you're using now. So, you know, I'm, also, I'm actually trying to translate what you're doing into an understandable format so that we can figure sure. out what, what, we're, what we're paying here. Uh, seems like a lot to do to just get – some clarity on this, but I'm willing to do it because I don't think there's there are many more options. Uh, what's your response to that? How do you think uh, your PBMs respond to that uh, being put, all of them, not just some, but all of, you, all of the PBMs competing in that, in that you know, federal acquisition uh, regulatory format? Well, we do a lot of different subcontracting work. I'd have to brush up on what exactly the details were here. Um, and I'd also want to see, again, that it really saved money um, and that the transparency involved, if there were transparency provisions, were things that actually helped you get where you're going uh, and generated real savings. That's something that we'd want to take a look at. We would mention, however, and there's an obvious point, I don't mean to go back to it, but FEHPP, despite everything we've heard today, is a very popular program, including the drug benefit. People like it. You don't hear a lot of people, and maybe you do. I'm not an FEHPP, um, and you probably are. I don't hear a lot of people saying, gosh, I hate that FEHPP plan. I, I hear them saying, hey, it's pretty good. I'm a federal employee. It's one of the perks. It's why I'm there. But the you taxpayer know. is picking up a tab. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so. No, no, I, I agree. I they're agree. not paying for it, so sure, it's a good deal. You no, know? it's a good deal, but then the FEHPP is always competing for employees and doing it on their benefits, so they don't want to skimp too much either. So we'll give skimpy benefits or generous benefits depending on how much people want to pay and what they want to accomplish. But to answer your question, we'd take a look at it is all I can say. I'm not that familiar with it, but we're happy to take a look at it and work with you and your staff on it. Okay. Well, as I have with the other two panels, uh, you know, I, obviously I didn't hit all the uh, all of the landscape of issues that could arise in this, but uh, I'm going to ask you if there's some area that we missed or some area you'd wish to amplify or uh, emphasize, uh, just take two minutes, uh, starting with Dr. Needleman. Uh, okay. Thank you. you. Um, 
First, I want to just reiterate the point that has been made by me, Mr. Merritt, others of the potential for real value added from the PBMs. They have real expertise in claims administration, drug-drug interaction, working with the pharmacies, working with patients, all of which should be acknowledged and is a service that's probably worth paying for. Uh, Having said that, everything that uh, Mr. Merritt said about the role of the PBMs in dealing with clients and providers and negotiation could also be said about health insurance and managed care providers all operating all operating under administrative service only contracts with far more transparencies than we see in the PBM contracts. Uh, if we're looking at transparency, there are models. Uh, I would encourage the committee to take a closer look and get more information about exactly how TRICARE is paying for the administrative services uh, under the its PBM contract, given that it is paying clearly scheduled prices for the drugs themselves. Um, those are my specific comments about the, the nuts and bolts. I, I think one of the issues that the committee needs to think about um, is the nature of the FEHBP program. It has been run as essentially uh, a private sector program with the federal government operating as a private sector employer in terms of the way it contracts with health plants. Some of the changes that I've heard discussed today, some of which I would possibly endorse if with additional study, involve changing that relationship. The DOD relationship, the VA relationship is all very different than an employer uh, relationship with health plans. So you need to think about whether you're really prepared to walk down that road in order to achieve cost savings. Um, And finally, in that regard, part of the way in which the plans get cost savings, DOD, VA, is through a quite explicit uh, use of formularies for sole source branded patented drugs. The PBMs are also doing that, and the individual health plans within FEHBP are doing that. Uh, So it's not unusual to see formularies in federal plans, but whether you're prepared to go, but in order to achieve some of the kinds of negotiated price savings that potentially you're talking about here, You will have to, if you're going with a single point of entry for the federal employees, you'll have to be prepared to negotiate uh, a well-constructed, well-thought-through formulary that will apply to all the federal employees rather than the individual formularies that you're seeing in the FEHBP plans. You need to think about whether you're prepared to take that route. Very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Needleman. Dr. Dilatori. So I want to begin by just echoing um, what Dr. Needleman just said about centralizing a formulary and really using the purchasing power of the federal government to its benefit. I think as we look, as we sit where we are now in healthcare, fundamental change needs to happen. It can't be small incremental change. We need to do something big and drastic. We have to get used to the fact, as citizens, that we can't have everything all the time in the most convenient location. It's just too expensive. I think it comes down to something very simple. I mean, what is the cost? It's the cost of the drug, what you pay the pharmacy, and the markup. And then everything else is a benefit or a potential service that is provided. And I think we just need to look at it that simply. I mean, the ph- big pharma said we can, we're can we going to help provide $80, $80 billion over 10 years. Well, if you use FSS schedule or if you use 340B, hey, I, I just found the first 5 to $10 billion for them. They only got 70 more to find on their own. So I would take them up on it. That's a great point. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, first, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I did used to live in Norwood. <laughs> uh, there was something I liked about you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no, I was born in Virginia, but but my next door neighbor was uh, Chet Curtis. To age myself, I think when Good he was man. married to Natalie Jacobson. I'm not sure it was before or after, but we won't go there. We won't yeah, go there. there. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's too late now. But I thought I'd throw it in there. Uh, I would just say, uh, in conclusion, thanks for your time. Thanks for all your focus on this, spending hours on this. I don't think I've ever seen a member of Congress spend this much time on this. I really appreciate that. We feel like the more people learn about us, the better. We don't, we're not hiding from that. It's just difficult to explain this sometimes. I would just suggest that whatever solutions you offer in regards to transparency, that you don't make the mistake that the rest of the Medicare program has made with doctors and hospitals where you move to kind of a cost-plus basis where you say, well, I don't care what you do, and I'm just going to pay a little percentage on top. I just want to see everything you do. The danger in that, and again, we've seen this with uh, doctors and hospitals, but in the drug space, the danger is 
you want to make sure we have incentives to generate even more savings and for, and for PBMs to compete against each other to generate more savings. You don't want a situation where we get paid the same amount if we um, uh, dispense a generic or brand. Um, or that if we don't care if it's delivered by mail or just at a drugstore, if we're going to get paid anyway, why do we care? That's the one reason why the only part of Medicare we're saving money is the one that we administer, Medicare Part D, which is coming 30 percent under budget, which is unheard of for a federal program. Now, Med D is interesting because it's the biggest, probably the most successful uh, uh, federal initiative that neither party wants to take credit for. But for whatever reason, it's working and we're part of it and it's counterintuitive, but I would just make sure that the incentives are really strong because we can save a lot more money than we are right now. And hopefully if there's a silver lining to this whole era of all the deficits and so forth, it'll, let people take, it'll be the people and policymakers take a second look at other ways we can save money. So we'd be happy to work with you on, on ways to do that. And so thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. And on that note, we, we do appreciate your willingness to come here. Uh, and help us, and, and this is an ongoing process. And the bottom line for us is the bottom line. We want to, we want to save money. It's not we don't have uh, you know there are no good guys and bad guys in this thing. We we just want to uh, we, we've got an obligation here to try to provide the, these products and, and uh, health care at the uh, lowest responsible price that we can for for uh, our federal employees. But again, I want to thank you each for your your testimony. You did a great job. Helped the committee a great deal. And I want to thank you for your time here. Have a good day. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. This hearing is now adjourned. Nice job.